Yeah. Looks like Aaron might be having some technical problems. Yes, technical. She can probably hear us, but we can't hear her. There we go. Now, are you able to hear me? Yes. 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 All right. So our internet just took a tank down at City Hall. So I am oh. trying to run this from my phone. Oh, <laughs> So give, give me a second because I'm going off cellular data and it's not super reliable. <clears throat> All right, I think that was a fine recovery. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think uh, we can, the meeting uh, can come to order. Um, Aaron, would you please take roll? Esther? <laughs> Here. Marcy? Here. Osmond's not here that I have seen. Uh, Jerry Donovan? Here. Meridian? Here. Adams? Here. And Richard Donovan? Here. Oops, sorry, and Holly Leo? Here. Um, uh, just a few things. Um, I want. Oh, I want to welcome everybody back. It's going to be a great meeting. Um, I'm excited to see Ryan Heiss is here, our new city manager, uh, and such a good turnout uh, for the meeting. I am excited that the friends will be showing us the entire trail today um, as requested by popular demand from this committee. Um, and I also am going to move some items around here, so bear with me on my Roberts rules, which are not the best. Um, but before we hear from the public, uh, we need to approve the minutes and approve the agenda. So can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move. Adams? A second. Richard will second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, can I have a roll, please? Aaron. Adams? Yes. Richard Donovan? Yes. Trester? Yes. Marcy? Yes. Jerry Donovan? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Leo? Yes. Uh, next, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Okay. Can I get a second, please? I'll second it. Mark, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, any discussion? All right, quick roll call, please, Aaron. Trester? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Marcy? Yes. Osmond? Oh, sorry, Jerry Donovan? Yes. Adams? Yes. Richard Donovan? Yes. Leo? Yes. Thank you. Um, and now we have comments from the public at this time. And if you could limit your comments to three minutes, please. I see Dan Fox has his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. This one's here. Though. Thanks very much. I'll be brief. I have it on mute. <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, my comment concerns agenda item 10A, which is basically an email that I sent uh, to City Hall for the committee. And my request of you is, is really simple. I want to withdraw that email. I want that email to be eliminated from your discussions today and from the record. And here's why. Uh, Washington Post has a, has a slogan that says democracy dies in the darkness and a little bit of that democracy died in the darkness on this uh, email of mine. Because my right, my, literally my right to communicate to you directly was violated by someone. I have no idea who. But my email was edited and that was not disclosed to me nor if I believe what's in the packet, was it disclosed to any of you? And I don't know who's responsible for that. I really don't. But I'm sure someone 
felt that it was within their purview to censor my remarks, that they had a right to do so. Uh, but absent obscenity in, the, in my remarks, which there was none, local government has no such right, period. Those remarks should have been given to you exactly as I wrote them. Now the commercial record routinely edits my letters, but that's by mutual agreement. It's within their right. It's within the scope of what they do. But in any case, I withdraw the email. You can read my letter if you're so interested in, I think last week's edition of the commercial record where it was not censored. At, at the end here, honestly, I believe I'm owed an apology and somebody in City Hall is due a reprimand. I don't know who that is. And quite honestly, I don't expect either of those, the apology or the reprimand to occur, but you should know that conceivably, I'm not the only one who's having edited remarks come to this committee. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, moving on to new business, the Friends uh, we'll present the trail and the route design. So uh, I'm going to hand things over to Richard and John at this time. Okay, thanks, Holly. Let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, first, like to just uh, on behalf of the friends, thank the committee for inviting us to give the presentation and thanks to Aaron for technical assistance. Uh, I'm going to kind of take the lead uh, with the presentation. Clark Carmichael, who is our new president, uh, is going to uh, get into some of the details of the engineering uh, aspects of the uh, root options. Uh, and then uh, John Adams, who's our past president and still on the board, will uh, keep us honest and point out things that we may miss. Uh, we thought we, what we do is pause for questions from the committee after uh, different sections of the presentation, uh, just because a subsequent slide may answer a question that somebody has. So we'll, we'll let you know uh, when we would like to have questions from the committee. Uh, we assume that the committee uh, was diligent and had a chance to review the PowerPoint. So we're not gonna just read it to you or go through every, every detail, uh, but we will try to point out a few things and, and uh, embellish some of the points that were made. Uh, and of course, some of you, you know, may be familiar with a lot of these issues and, and uh, points uh, but others are less so. So uh, we're, we're trying to gear this to, to educate everybody on the committee and get everyone up to the same level of knowledge. Okay, and my slide is not moving. Ah. Okay. Um, a few other introductory comments. We're not trying to address every detail. Uh, the, the engineers uh, subsequently uh, will be able to do that and there'll be a chance for the governing bodies to review all those details before approving the applications for grants which will be necessary to build the trail. Uh, right now we're trying to get kind of a, a, a higher level uh, agreement from the committee uh, about the uh, route and the design. Uh, the engineers will provide you know, their detailed plans at a later point. Um, second point, uh, you're gonna hear more about AASHTO, the American Association of uh, Safety and Highway Engineers uh, and Transportation Officials. Um, that is a body that uh, exists, has existed for a long time. Uh, they uh, make standards for all different kinds of transportation related uh, infrastructure. But for our purposes, uh, they have a, uh, 
a guide to bicycle facilities, they call it, which is now in the fourth edition. It was published in 2012. It's over 200 pages long, and it goes through a lot of detail about how to design uh, trails and other facilities that are going to be used in whole or in part by bicycles. Uh, MDOT in the state of Michigan uh, follows AASHTO, as do most states. Uh, and so that is something that we have to be very concerned with, because as we've said before, if uh, MDOT does not approve uh, a design, we don't get money from their TAP program, the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is federal money administered by the states. Uh, we're relying on that for 50% of the cost of building the trail. So if we don't get that money, we can't build the trail. Uh, and, and the Friends, as an organization, would not be interested uh, in any uh, proposed options uh, for this section of the trail that do not meet AASHTO for that reason. Uh, a li quick little bit of history. Uh, Fleece and Vandenbrink was retained by the Friends in the fall of 2018 uh, to uh, study uh, the options for the trail going through Saugatuck City. Uh, previous to that, a different engineering firm, Hurley Stewart, had been retained by the Friends uh, to work with uh, the Friends and the Township on certain aspects of uh, the trail through the Township, which we will see. Um, Fleece and Vandenbrink terminated that engagement in the fall of 2019. Up to that point, they had uh, provided uh, input and detailed engineering plans on several different options, but primarily the one we're going to be looking at today, what we call option one, is a two-lane option uh, through the city. Uh, subsequent to her, uh, Fleece and Brandenburg terminating the engagement, or right around that same time, um, we also had been looking at a three-lane option because uh, there certainly was a sentiment on the city council to retain the center lane over the bridge, uh, but it never got to the point where Fleece and Vandenbrink was able to give any final uh, opinions and, and was not able to come up with actual engineering plans. So just keep that in mind when we're looking at these two sets of options. Um, just so, so it's clear, the Friends as an organization does not have a particular preference uh, for these uh, several options in the city and in the, in the township. What the Friends as an organization wants is to build the trail. And to do that, as I said, we need to meet the AASHTO standards. So if we can find a solution that MDOT will accept, uh, the Friends will probably be comfortable with that. Uh, and we can go ahead. Uh, if you were to ask any of the board members of the Friends individually, they may well have preferences. But uh, as an organization, our main goal is to build the trail, and that requires MDOT money and compliance with AASHTO. Uh, we say here remaining concerns. There were a number of concerns that have been expressed, in particular uh, in the city, uh, by the city council at various meetings and workshops. And there's a list of them in the addendum, uh, which shows uh, what, uh, which of those concerns were met and how. Uh, and that was mainly prepared by Fleece and Vandenbrink uh, as well before they terminated the engagement. But we're now focused on what are the key remaining concerns. Some of them, as this slide shows, were shared by uh, all three of the communities and the friends. Uh, I, as we point out, I think there's a general sense that uh, parts of the existing layout are unsafe and confusing and need to be addressed. Um, we, uh, we just point out that uh, there's a difference between annual maintenance versus long-term repair and replacement. Uh, I believe the committee will subsequently deal with some of the maintenance issues. Uh, we're not gonna get into that in any detail today. Uh, today, we're really just concerned 
to the extent that maintenance may uh, affect the choice of a, a route or a design. Uh, and we'll talk further about that. Uh, aesthetics, uh, we, we the friends and hopefully you and the residents want to build a trail that we're all proud of. Uh, something that you know, we can enjoy and uh, talk about with our friends and, and relatives. Uh, it, we don't necessarily wanna be, build the least expensive option nor do we want to build something that's unnecessarily expensive or extravagant. Um, so I would just ask you keep that in mind when we're talking about this too. W what would be uh, a trail that we would all be proud of and happy to, to, uh, to use? Um, okay, so then we talk about the re remaining concerns in the city and the township. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, let me stop there briefly and just see, do we have any questions so far from the members of the committee? Not hearing any? Okay, great. Um, so talking a little bit more about MDOT, uh, as I've said, the, the, the TAP program is the source of 60% of probably of projected funding. The rest will come from the DNR trust fund and from private donations uh, and fundraising by the friends. Um, I've already talked about Ashto uh, and the, you know, their guide uh, and why it's important that we follow Ashto. Uh, the last point is another one to keep in mind. Um, the way MDOT works is until you actually submit your grant application with detailed engineering drawings and, and all the information they want, they're not gonna give you specific guidance on whether a particular design uh, would meet their approval. Uh, it's frustrating, I know, and we've tried uh, numerous times to get some more specific feedback, but that's the way they work. So once you submit the application, um, then they will come back to you after their, their engineers review it and they'll raise any questions they have and get into discussions about possible tweaks to the design or alternate uh, designs that might be appropriate. Okay, so next is just to give you an overview to make sure everyone's clear on what we're looking at. There's essentially three sections uh, left that we wanna build to complete what we refer to as the north section of the trail. Uh, and I, you know, again, this is pretty self-explanatory, I think. And we're going to basically review them in order. Uh, so uh, we'll start from the south uh, with the bridge, uh, Douglas and Saugatuck City, and there, there are, as you've seen in the in the materials, basically two options: two lanes or three lanes, uh, and. I'll now turn it over to Clark to, to uh, take us through those. Clark, you there? Yes, if you can move to the next slide and can everyone hear me okay? Good. Hi, right, this, um, this rendering highlights the primary differences between option one on the top and the two lane option um, and, the, and and the option two, which includes the three lane option below that. Option one was designed and presented by F and B in June of 2019. Um, it, was, it was done to be ASHTO compliant. And it is a multi-use trail by using a roadway bed to cross the Kalamazoo Bridge. It combines a standard 10 foot trail. I see, can you see my arrow or is that? Mm. That the standard uh, yes. 10 foot trail yes. with two foot yes. trail barriers. And then to the left of that is a five foot barrier that's striped. That's to protect the, the users of the trail from the vehicles on the southbound lane, which is 11 foot trail, both on the southbound lane and the northbound lane. And then on the far left is another five foot roadway buffer. 
we'll go into more detail on the very aspects of option one lower. Uh, excuse me, as we go on with the presentation. Option two below is that option that we have no engineering drawings for, but we were able to discuss it with F and B before they resigned. And we've had some feedback from MDOT and MDOT um, has said that they have formally um, informally approved this. Um, however, details would have to be presented as Richard said um, to um, get their approval. How this is different from the one above and we'll be, we'll be coming back to this slide later. As you can see, the, the, the uh, 14 foot trail above is able to be reduced to 10 feet because a vertical separator, if you go down there, Richard, to the, that, that portion, of the vertical separator, not a striped a buffer zone, but a vertical separator will protect the users of the trail. By doing that, it can obviously reduce the, the width of the entire um, 10 foot trail or the, what's used for the trail and the buffer and allows the center lane to be included in this option. As I mentioned, we will be coming back to this later after we've done a complete review of option one. So I'll, I, we, can, we can answer any questions after we get through the uh, option one um, presentation portion. If you go on to the next slide, Richard, that'd be great. When F and V designed the section of trail from Douglas to Lake Street in Salt Tuck City, they presented it in four contiguous parts. Each of the four parts are reviewed in summary form in a letter from F and V. This letter, which is in our addendum, provides more in-depth information than what we will be highlighting on our presentation today. This is a rendering of part one, and it is the section of trail from the Kalamazoo River Bridge to Washington Street. This is the portion of trail that would be located in Douglas. The intersection in the background um, is where Main Street and Washington Street intersect the Blue Star Highway. The concept used in Douglas south of Washington Street would be extended approximately 200 feet north using a raised curb to place the trail within the existing roadway while maintaining the left-hand turn lane onto Main Street. Okay, we can move on to the next. This, this is F and B's drawing of the preceding rendering. The drawing is on the top portion of the, uh, excuse me, the drawing on the top portion of the slide shows how the trail seamlessly lines up with the existing trail in Douglas. Because of this smooth transition, FMV believes the existing island, can you point that out there, Richard? Thank you. Um, believes the existing island south of Washington Street can be removed and replaced by a less intrusive barrier or rumble strips. It also just makes the, the entire intersection less confusing as it stands today because it's so well aligned. Um, does anyone have any questions about um, or comments about part one that's been presented so far? Okay. I guess before we move on, I would like to just to show, just briefly mention that each of these drawings have a, has a, um, a description of what it is depicting. And in the very middle section of this drawing, you see a clear width reconfiguration. This is kind of almost a cross section of the trail and it'll be consistent through all the drawings. Um, so in this case, you're seeing this, uh, the, the very beginning of Douglas, um, there's a 46, 47 foot clear width distance between the sidewalks and the 14 foot trail and the one foot curb as depicted here and then uh, 11 foot lane and a 10 foot lane and 11 foot lane. So we will be looking at these type of drawings um, as we continue with the presentation. I'm gonna move on to the, the next one there, Richard. This is a rendering of part, true, part two of the trail and it is another view of the bridge portion of the trail that we looked at earlier. 
the existing seven foot raised sidewalk is shown on the right side of the render. That would be primarily used by pedestrians for walking, running, and the roadway portion of the trail, which is immediately to the left, is 14 feet in width. It would actually be striped so that there would be two lanes um, that the cyclists could understand and so the users of the trail would, and it actually would have one foot buffers on either side of the 10 foot roadway trail. Hope you, hope you can understand that the rendering did not really uh, follow the drawings that well. Then immediately to the east of the roadway trail is that five foot buffer that was previously mentioned. And then the two 11 foot um, road vehicle um, lanes. And there still is room on using this configuration for a five foot um, buffer for the existing five foot raised sidewalk. This buffer actually would or could be used by cyclists who um, insist on you know, riding with traffic um, um, along the right side of the roadway. Okay, next slide. This is FMV's drawing of the preceding rendering again. This drawing details the dimensions we just reviewed. It also shows that the total width of the roadway along in the bridge area is 46 feet. So that's really kind of, that's, that's really the width that we have to deal with regardless of any option that is presented. Um, so once again, this is just showing the same thing um, that we had just gone over in terms of the renderings. Does anyone have any questions in regards to the comments about the um, dimensions or how this is presented? Okay, we can go on to the next slide, please. This is a rendering of part three, and it shows how the trail transitions from the roadway north of the bridge. So that's in that, yes, thank you, Richard. That's doing a good job there. <laughs> north, of, north of the bridge to a separated 10 foot trail on the other side of the existing trees in this area. So as you're moving north, you're, you're, you're leaving the roadway and then um, going on to an expanded sidewalk section that would serve as the trail. Um, the, the existing sidewalk there is seven feet excuse me, so it would be expanded to 10 feet and there would be at least two feet of grass buffer on either side of the 10 foot trail. This also shows um, that, well, let's move on to the next slide, please. I think that'll probably be an easier way to look at it. This is, this is um, what is this, slide 15? Yeah. Um, this is another rendering of part three. It shows the expanded sidewalk trail and how it continues north to Lake Street. It also shows how the, the trail would cross Lake Street. So it, and then it continues up north along that expanded sidewalk. If we could go to the next slide, which is the drawing of this. This is a drawing of the essentially the two preceding renderings that we looked at earlier. Um, what I think needs to be highlighted is, is that the existing lanes that are there today are unchanged with this option. There still is an acceleration lane and a southbound lane and a center lane and then northbound. And essentially the, the, the roadway is um, not impacted at all. That's because we're obviously using the expanded sidewalk um, as the, the trail in this area. Does anyone have any questions about how this transition occurs up from the roadway over to the sidewalk um, and up to Lake Street? Or any comments? Okay, that's great. Um, we could move on to slide 17. This is a rendering of part four. It shows how the intersection would look if traffic signals were installed. 
It also shows that the trail and signals would have little impact on Sodcuck's pallet welcome sign. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. This is another rendering of part four. It shows how the intersection and traffic signals would appear as you approach the highway on Lake Street. Really would look very similar to it as it does today, except for obviously the traffic signals would be, would be there. Okay, move on to the next drawing. This is the actual drawing of the intersection. This drawing shows that the crosswalk lines up with the expanded sidewalk on the south side of Lake Street. North of the intersection, the trail uses a portion of the existing southbound right turn lane from the highway. So the trail won't impact the existing landscaping around the welcome sign. It also shows that right where Richard is pointing this, that section there, there would be a small curb protecting the users of the trail that goes around that corner and north um, up um, towards Maple Street. But the, the crosswalk would go in slightly, um, or west I should say, and then cross the street. Because it does go a little bit west, the, the, um, the stopping point for the cars on Lake Street is also pushed back um, a little bit west as well. Um, that actually um, probably is a good thing. And then what happens quite often in those situations is that the if there's no one using the trail, they would just gradually move forward and turn right to take advantage of the acceleration lane. Okay, the next slide. Before, excuse me, before oh. you do. I'm sorry, sure. Before we go on, um, if you could just go back to the uh, drawing preceding that last schematic slide. It's just the one, Ken? No, one more back, please. Okay. I'm a little there. Draw, okay. Okay, so that's, we're, we're proceeding northbound and it's, it's really showing, although it's not striped, uh, two traffic lanes. And um, where's the right turn lane? Oh, so, you, mean, you mean from this on north of the um, Lake Street? Okay, yeah, I, I wish I could point to it, but yeah. the, the lane that's the farthest on the left, right. is, I assume the right turn lane, right? Well, I, I'm, I think some of the right turn lanes I mentioned earlier um, is taken, is being used by the, um, the trail itself. And so that would be the natural place for, oops, the natural place for people to stop. Okay. The, the, the set, there is, uh, you know, obviously still a center lane there that's not going to be used because no one's going to be turning left, but it does allow emergency responders uh, to go around cars that might be stopped in the right turn hand lane um, and go through that intersection to continue on, on the southbound lane on the other side, if that makes any sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Right, Richard, do you want to take it over from here or? Yeah, sure, I can address this. So, um, you know, there's mention about the traffic signals. Um, these are uh, optional in a sense. Uh, you, can, you can obviously build the trail without them. Um, but uh, first of all, just to be clear, they would operate only during high season. Uh, the, the, they could be controlled so they would only work as a, a blinking light during, uh, during the off season. Uh, importantly, they would be remotely controlled by first responders and the remote control we're told has about a half a mile range. So as they're coming down Blue Star Highway towards the bridge, they can make the lights go red and stop traffic from, uh, from crossing the bridge. Uh, it, they would, uh, at least in some ways, improve safety and traffic flow at the intersection, and, and we, we can get into more details of that. But um, Fleece and Vandenbrink estimated in, in 2019 that they would cost 
roughly $250,000. Uh, they are not covered by the TAP grant, but um, we understand that uh, a CMAC grant, uh, which is congestion mitigation and air quality, uh, probably would fund a good portion of it. That's administered through uh, the county uh, and the road commission. Uh, and informal discussions we've had, I would say with, uh, you know, certainly over a hundred different residents, people generally were very much in favor of this. And in fact, a number of people commented that, you know, they don't understand why there's not a, a traffic signal there already. Uh, but this was not at all a formal survey. Um, you can also do uh, the engineering uh, for the traffic lights and not install the lights themselves, you know, not install the poles and all, but have the infrastructure underground and the wiring uh, set up while the rest of the trail work is being done. And then at a, a later point in time, install the, the, uh, the lights themselves. So that is also a possible option that's been mentioned. Um, just wanted to stop here and talk a little bit about the emergency access point. And Clark's already mentioned a couple of the points, but um, this is of course a main reason why uh, some people think that you, you need to retain the center lane over the bridge. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is certainly open for discussion. And as far as I know, nobody on this call is a traffic safety engineer. So none of us are really qualified to evaluate uh, the need in that respect. But just we just point out a few things to keep in mind when we're discussing whether uh, the two lane option is a viable option and whether you really need a three lane with the center option. Uh, and, you know, we can go into this in more detail if anybody uh, wants to later. Um, the other thing I guess I would point out is if you just look while you're driving around town, um, there are many places along Blue Star Highway and Park Street and elsewhere where it's only two lanes. You know, you don't have a center lane. Uh, and there's not a lot of room for cars to pull over. So it, that, that circumstance is not unique to the bridge. And Richard, can I just interrupt you um, really sure. quick? Um, I neglected to um, mention that um, we did invite public safety to the table today. And um, I, I see some, some folks joined us. Um, uh, Chief Janik had a COVID related meeting today, so he wasn't able to join us, but he is um, uh, looking at these designs and open to just taking a fresh look at both of the designs. Um, and we anticipate that he will be working very closely along with um, other safety professionals in the community um, with the engineer. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Holly. Okay, Clark, you want to pick this up again and tell us about the three lane option? Um, the three lane option um, is essentially a split trail and it's very similar to um, the very option one to where really the pedestrian um, and runners would be using the sidewalk and then the um, the narrow bike lane on the roadway because we were able to narrow the, um, the bike lane possibly because of the vertical barrier. Um, so let's move on to the next. This, this is actually, we saw this earlier, um, this is kind of a close up of option number two. And then once again, we're kind of just go quickly from um, the right side of the slide, which is the west side of the, of the bridge. And so you would have the existing seven foot um, sidewalk, raised sidewalk, then it would be using the existing roadway um, for the 10 foot trail. And then there would be a vertical barrier. Then really the vertical barrier of two feet that, um, and the remaining uh, dimensions that are depicted on this slide, since this was not done by an engineer, it was done by us 
but it, it, it was done by us with feedback from FMV before they resigned and some feedback from MDOT. So this is only one possible way to use the remaining space. Um, and that would be to allow after the vertical separator, a one foot buffer that just kind of gives the cars a feeling they're not right on top of the vertical um, separator, whatever that might be. And that would be something that would have to be presented by the engineer to the city council to determine what type of separator you would like. There are so many of them, it's almost impossible to review all of them. Um, but it would have to be the one comment that was made is that the vertical separator should be crash worthy. We do not know what that means in terms of construction and how it would appear and if, if it has anything to do with height or, or whatever. That's an, an engineering question that would have to be addressed in the future. Then by using this, you can see we now have room for the center lane. Um, that's a 10 foot center lane. Um, I believe we, we did some auto turn analysis um, from Greg Janik in terms of his concerns about not having a center lane. And in that, he described, I think, the, the larger fire trucks um, to be eight and a half feet. And I guess maybe they're nine and a half feet in width, including the, the mirrors. Um, maybe some of the people that are with us today can confirm that one way or the other. Um, but obviously, with this configuration, it's very similar to the way it exists today. Uh, you would still have the, the, the lanes on either side. It would limit, obviously, the use of the, um, to a certain extent, on the, at least on the bridge. You would lose the five foot buffer on the far east side, it would end up being a one foot roadway buffer. So I, I assume if a, if a cyclist was riding along the um, the northbound lane rather than using our trail. The, the cars would have to probably, you know, use the 10 foot center lane to pass. Them. So this is, once again, this is option number two. This is the only thing that we can really show you, but it's, it's focusing on the, the bridge simply because those were, as to the location of where the concerns were expressed that the two lane option might um, reduce the response time uh, for emergency responders. Are there any questions on this? Um, question? Sure. Uh, I believe you, when we're talking about the uh, two foot buffer barrier uh, with vertical except separation, the two feet is, is width, not height. Uh, is that correct? Correct, and that was something that we just saw that many of the vertical separation right. uh, so, items that we saw were typically two feet in width, and so that was just a, a width that we, we chose. Right, well, so is there any standard that dictates the height of such a uh, separator? Um, besides the comment that um, MDOT made the word has to be crash worthy, Ken, I don't know if there is. Okay, thanks. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. We can move on to the next slide. So this, this is essentially um, kind of a, a recap of what we've already talked about. MDOT has informally approved the concept, but the specific requirements are clear and an engineer would have to be hired um, if this if this option wants to be if we want to pursue this option and then obviously when it comes to the bike lane and the buffer it would be the space required for it from option option one is 19 feet it could reduce it at least as as we're illustrating down to 13 feet and that allows for the center lane and then of course the divider um, raises an aesthetic and maintenance concern um, and we originally, our focus really was on trying not to have any type of a vertical separation based on the comments we had heard from council earlier. But this was, this option two was, is being um, presented so that we could address the center lane concern. Okay. We can move on to the next slide. 
Richard, I don't know if you want to take over from here or do you want me to, I mean, we just, this is obviously still, this is just a couple of many, 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 many vertical separators. Um, they really, they really don't have a very good uh, source for these type of things. Um, obviously, there are um, many other kinds. And so we're just trying to show that there are two examples. The, the example on the left is approximately two feet in width. It does, one of the concerns that you have on the bridge is that it does have to be able to allow the water to go underneath whatever separator you have there from a drainage standpoint. This also, this type of separator also um, allows um, responders to go over the, um, um, the cement itself is the, the way that it is shaped. Otherwise, there's so many other vertical separators and as Ken asked earlier, we don't know what the required height would be or the required width. Um, and, and of course, there could be all sorts of ideas on how a separator could be constructed. So we can move on from here. Now we're revisiting um, what we did earlier. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of the option one on the two lane option above and how we're really essentially just restriping the existing roadway. Oops. And then option two, the three lane option. Um, the only thing that's really different in it is that we are restriping, but it does require the vertical separator protect, to protect the users of the trail. And by therefore you can add the center lane. Okay. Now we're gonna move on to um, actually part five, which covers the area from Lake Street to Maple Street. It essentially is a continuation of um, the idea of having a, the trail go along the west side of the highway. Um, it was brought in a little bit closer to the road uh, um, as compared to the original options. And this, this reduces the need for some of the um, reinforcement and retaining wall and significantly reduce the, um, the cost related to this portion of the trail. Um, between the trail itself, there's a, there's, there's a buffer area and a portion of that would likely to be grass um, so that it gives you a more visual appearance when um, people are, are driving down the roadway and it also allows to put signage in the grass area. Um, and we move on to the next slide. This is actually the, uh, we do not have a rendering of this because the focus was more on the aesthetics part of the intersection and the bridge itself. But this is the, the drawing from um, FMV showing how the trail would continue north from Lake Street. And as you can see, uh, the very top part of the, um, of the drawing is showing the, the motorized trail going north um, on the west side of the highway. Then it, the lower portion is a continuation of the trail as it's going north. And then it comes to the, the Maple Street intersection. That, that, that is where um, it's kind of the dividing line, I believe, between um, Salt Tuck City and the township in that, area, in that spot. And below, you can see the kind of the cross section of the trail to where it's a 14 foot um, motorized trail that's using essentially the same concept that um, option one uses on the bridge. Um, where it's a 10 foot trail with two foot buffers on each side. Then there's the, the five foot buffer again um, to protect the, um, the users from the vehicles on the roadway. That is where the, uh, the two foot portion of grass would be located. And then um, as FMV is pointing out here, there are two lanes and there can be some variability in terms of the width of the lanes and where they're located in this section of the trail design. Are there any questions about or comments about this section of trail? So um, it's, I think it's my understanding that the work that needed to be done um, 
on the roadway was fairly minor. Is that is that correct that there's not any major um, um, I know that there was a ditch that maybe needed to be filled in or um, but but it wasn't considered to be a major reconstruction of the side of the road. Is that correct? Not only the road, but also the areas um, that are north of the trail itself. Um, okay. So that is that um, was taken into account in the in, in option um, one in particular, because it's really in response to many comments from city council. Um, and it was utilizing you know, the various options that um, FNB had originally presented. And so it, not only does it reduce the construction costs, but it would also reduce the overall ma annual maintenance costs. But yeah, Holly, you're right. I mean, as they say in the diagram here, you might have to do a little work on the slope, the, the retaining wall, possibly install a guardrail somewhere. Whoops. But, um, but otherwise, you're just using the existing uh, shoulder and roadway, so there's not a lot of infrastructure that has to be built there. Okay. And the section between um, Lake Street and Maple Street, um, I don't believe there's a single driveway in that area. Are there any yeah. other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, any, anything else about the, the city uh, design uh, before we proceed to the township? And I guess, Holly, it's your intention to then have a discussion period afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we just completed um, what was actually section number one and the kind of the overall map that Richard um, showed in the, early, in the earlier part of the presentation. Now we're moving on to um, section number two between Maple Street and Old Allegheny. Both of these, um, these remaining sections are located in Sawtuck Township. This um, is the engineering design done by Hurley Stewart. Um, the Park Commission in Sawtuck Township and the board um, have approved this design in terms of concept. Obviously, there are lots of other things that would be required for more formal approval, including uh, updated cost numbers. But once again, this, this shows that it's using, the trail is using the existing right of way um, on the west side of the highway um, to build the trail. And there's not much I can really add to what, um, to what that you're not seeing there. Um, except for that the Park Commission um, did review it and they were comfortable with it. So that was, that's a good aspect of this trail, this portion. Are there any questions about this section? North of the section that we just looked at, um, we have our existing trail and that terminates at um, North Street. Um, so the originally um, several, geez, I think it was back in 2014, the idea with, was that we would take the trail from where it ends at Blue Star Highway and North Street. Now, the goal is to connect to the Beeline Trail in the upper left of the, of the picture. We did a look at one time just continuing, because it makes sense that we would do this, just to continue along the highway on the west side. However, there are some extremely um, steep grades there that fall down into the, kind of towards the Gush Horn Creek area um, that exists there. And so that really did not turn out to be a very, um, uh, no one really wanted to pursue that particular option. So the idea was that we would come up, the original concept was that we would go to the north side of North Street, which we, um, which Slogtuck Township originally thought was um, in their right of way. And it would cross over to Elizabeth Street. It would once again use a right of way, be a separated trail, 
cross over to Elizabeth Street, and then Elizabeth Street, because there is such a limited volume of traffic, um, it, the uh, Curly Stewart said, you know, I, most likely you would be able to just have the cyclists use the existing road, and then it, and you would probably have to build at least a sidewalk on one side of Elizabeth Street for pedestrians. There is some concern the Park Commission has expressed, but we did we did show this to them again. Um, we're looking at this option primarily because of Cindy Osmond's comment about that the Amoco, the Park Crossing Port. I can I'm sorry, I can never pronounce the park's name, but Amateur Park there. That that is an expensive portion of the of the trail construction. And so we we revisit we're revisiting the North Street option just to show you that there might be another option that might be less, less expensive, but because when we were first looking at this, um, it was discovered that since Sawtuck City is the Act 51 owner of North Street, they have a say of, um, for what goes into, maybe they even have to maintain, we don't know for sure, any trail that would use the right of way on the north side of North Street. Um, because of that concern and also because of the, the creek that comes down there, right there at the Maple Street intersection, there is some flooding occasionally there. And so the city um, did not really want to pursue that option um, back in, um, once they learned of it. And as a result, then the township developed the park plan. The park plan, as you can see in yellow, it actually is not using the right of way. It's just north of the right of way. And I believe it's an old trail line bed that used to be there or is there. Um, and it's built along that. And then short of the, uh, of the um, Maple Street, it then goes north. And this is actually more detail of the same plan. The, the expensive part of this trail um, a portion of trail is the bridge crossing. It's a fairly significant area of marsh and um, creek there that um, because of, you know, and just because of seasonality and rainfall can, it can change dramatically. So it's a fairly lengthy bridge and, and in, in terms of height and structure. Um, but that would go up along across the, the creek, the Gosh Warren Creek, and then continue up the hill and then wind up and go beside the cemetery. The park commission is excited about this option because they would most likely build the parking space there and, and possibly have some overviews of the trail. In, in essence, it would develop the park, um, this option. Then, as you can see, I'm sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around, but if you see this, the trail terminates essentially kind of on the, on the um, northwest side on Cemetery Road. The next, let's move, excuse me, before we leave that, um, this, this um, diagram, does anyone have any questions about it? Okay. Next slide, please. This is actually showing um, where the um, where the trail would use Cemetery Road in a similar manner as I described earlier, um, as it pertains to Elizabeth Street, because there's such little traffic along this road, uh, um, cyclists would just use the existing road, but there would need to be a sidewalk added for pedestrians on foot, and then that sidewalk would extend west to just short of Holland Street. And then as you can see, we build that trail piece to cross over um, Holland Street onto and get to the Beeline Trail on the other side of the road. So the considerations, um, the North Street is a less expensive, we really don't know. Um, it would have to be designed. Um, it would appear that it would need less um, um, boardwalk. Um, but at the same time, we would we need to, there are certain sections that might be more difficult to build in terms of cutting into um, embankments. 
Um, it also, it really wouldn't make sense for us to pursue that unless the city um, would reconsider um, the use of the right-of-way. If they would allow the right of way to be used, then then obviously something could be um, look more. We could, if if there's a need, we could um, design, or not, not design. I'm sorry. You know, we could investigate if that approach is even worthwhile, and would it reduce the expense? Pouch, the township um, um, park commission has expressed a preference for the, uh, the park crossing versus this in terms of overall beauty. Um, so as far as they're concerned, um, I, I, don't, I will, don't really feel comfortable talking for them. I got the, the feeling that unless there was a significant savings, they still would prefer um, the park crossing. And that kind of what, what's there below explains in some ways why they also prefer um, that, that option going over the park. Okay. Uh, we move on to the next slide. Um, this one shows some of the costs, uh, but I, I have to just emphasize the dates. You know, the, the cost estimates from Hurley Stewart are now, you know, over two years old. The ones from Fleece and Vandenbrink, uh, probably more than 18 months. Uh, and as you all know, I think, you know, construction costs have been going up during the pandemic and all. So the, these are just kind of rough numbers to give you a sense. Uh, and they exclude engineering costs, which roughly tend to be 20% uh, more uh, from what we're told. Uh, but you can see how it breaks down. Um, the most expensive section uh, is the one that Clark just reviewed in the township, uh, but that's because uh, th these costs are, uh, reflect the, the park option. We don't have numbers for the, the North Street, Elizabeth Street option. Uh, and, you know, there are contingencies here, uh, which the engineers always include, and, you know, some of them may be high, but, uh, you know, th that those are the numbers they gave us. Uh, and we previously mentioned the traffic signal as an option and, and what that would be. Uh, and, you know, the, the 250,000 is broken down between the actual cost estimate and the contingency. Um, this was for the city uh, option number one, which is the two lane option that we reviewed. Uh, the three lane option, uh, the really the, the only major difference is the vertical separators. and since we don't yet know what the design of those would be, we, we can't estimate what the cost would be, but probably not terribly expensive, I wouldn't think. And that brings us to next steps, which is really, of course, up to the committee. Um, we just put these suggestions in here, uh, you know, based on our knowledge and experience um, but, th you know, these are all things that the committee needs to consider and discuss. Holly, back to you. Great. Um, thank you. That's, I know it's a lot of information, um, but uh, I think you did a great job in um, just giving us an overall view of how the trail connects the three Com communities and what the options are. Um, can we open it up to general discussion with the committee? Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? I have a thought, one thought. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I have a file that I've had since I started on the bike trails, but this was very clear, very concise, and really helped me just gain more understanding about it. I really, I think you did a great job on the presentation and um, it's great because we also have it. So I just wanted to thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. I know bridges too can be a problem. Um, I think we've already experienced that, but it would be, 
such a beautiful part of the trail. You know, it's off the highway. It's not on residential streets. Um, and I'm amazed. Now, I've only lived here permanently for years, but I'm amazed at how many people don't know about our parks. And they are beautiful. So mm -hmm. just another, you know, boost for the parks, I think it would be. But of course, everything depends on cost and possibility and then the maintenance of those bridges. But that's a great idea. Well, Holly, um, yeah. my observation would be, I, I agree with Brenda that this was a very clear, concise, factual presentation. I, I thank the friends for doing this. We've mm -hmm. seen it before in kind of bits and pieces, and, and this tended to put everything together. Yeah. And I think I think that's what this committee is intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, some remaining questions are questions that none of us here probably can answer. Is is uh, mostly related to the Ashto requirements and the what the people at the state are going to require of us. You know, there's question. I, you know, the um, the the ten foot bike lane and three foot. Uh, auto lanes over the bridge, it's great, but we'll ask to accept a 10 foot wide um, mm -hmm. uh, bridge, or, excuse me, a 10 foot wide non-motorized trail with a buffer and then what that buffer would have to look like. Um, you know, secondly, if we, if, we, if we got some other configuration that we we're all happy with us from a safety standpoint, would ASHTO give us some leeway um, as they'll probably have to when the, when the um, Trail crosses 194. I mean, I, I don't know how you're going to maintain a, you know, an Ashto uh, approved bike lane across that bridge. So anyway, the, you know, to me, those are the some of the bigger questions because if we can answer what the uh, state and what Ashto would accept, that would lead us to, I think, a conclusion that most of us here would be very happy with. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe just to add to that, John, I, I know you've gone to them repeatedly and you're frustrated and not really getting a, a clear answer. Um, I, but I don't know if there's some political uh, um, interest that might work with us uh, to help out in that regard. I, I think there's a couple of options, maybe not, you know, mutually exclusive. Um, you know, one is just to, you know, build it to the pure intent of their standards and not take chances. And you know, you've got a plan that can be accepted uh, or at least have a pretty good uh, feeling that it can be accepted by, by MDOT because it meets ASHTO standards. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, we may come to the point where we feel like we're very close and we don't have clear guidance, but we know what we want as a community. And um, that may be the point where you go to MDOT and say, look at we've, you know, we've pushed this thing, we have an option, we've looked at all these other options, this is what works for us and why. And, and then we can try to get that input up front, but we may have to wait to the actual application to do that, um, which is unfortunate because that's a big process. Um, but at that point, we can get more feedback and there's back and forth that will take place, you know, along the entire section of the trail to kind of hone in on the final details. Um, and what they've told us is, you know, document exactly the process you've gone through, the options that you've looked at. Um, we've obviously looked at a lot of them, and I think we've got a lot of paper trail here that we've been very diligent in trying to find the right answer, and, and we present our best answer uh, that we as a community can accept and, um, you know, make it as close to Ashto as we possibly can. And, and maybe there's politics to play at that point. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, I just uh, in follow up. So, John, um, I, I've heard you say at some point that you, you put a presentation in an Ashton or the uh, MDOT people say yay or nay. I think what you just said is that even after you put the application in, there's room for negotiation. Is that is that correct? Well, you, you know, we've we've pressed them repeatedly. And, you know, what the reality of what we face is there are many, many communities and projects competing for these same dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they talk about a competitive application and competitive is, you know, their talk for, will we approve it? And it's, it may not be black or white, but if they have a very straightforward plan that's well documented and meets all their standards, we may be less competitive. So, you know, there's a balancing act here. Um, again, the best approach is to make it 
meet their standards. And that's what engineers, you know, why we hire them mm -hmm. to know those standards and help me meet those standards. Um, you know, but, you know, we can try something different, but it will affect the competitiveness of the application. And the closer we are to those standards, the more competitive it will be. Okay, thanks. Sorry to interrupt somebody. Oh, no. No, I, I was just um, going to say that I, I, it's my understanding that the 10 feet across the bridge meets AASHTO standards. Is that correct, gentlemen? I mean, I know we're not engineers, but I, I thought that it was 13 to 14 on the roadway and 10 feet across a bridge. Clark, you want to take that one? Well, with a vertical, vertical separator, um, we believe that we have had, you know, we've received informal approval of that. Um, okay. However, we can't guarantee it. And the, really the most important part of it will be what that vertical separator is and will that be something that's acceptable to the community from an aesthetic okay. standpoint. Um, right. So those are just things that we would have to consider when it comes to exploring mm -hmm. that um, the center lane or three lane option more. Okay, and Ken, when you say 94, I know you mean 96, but um, we are, I think we're just going to focus on um, the, our purview. We're just going to keep, keep sort of, uh, I think it's big enough. It's quite large, what the, the pieces that we're talking about. Um, and I also, it was this committee's suggestion. Actually, um, Ken and Cindy were very helpful last time in getting us to uh, go back and look at the engineering that's been done already and look at what we have. And I just want to say that the friends um, paid for this engineering. They budgeted thirteen to eighteen thousand dollars for for this engineering, and they've now spent twenty eight thousand. Just so we know where the meter is. But um, the two lane design is fully engineered um, and the three lane um, would need some input. Um, as you saw, just, just to finish it off. So that's just something to think about. Um, I, it was very interesting to me to go back and look at these designs again. Um, I think as a community, we started to focus a lot on the third lane. But this, the two lane is pretty interesting from a safety point of view. I'll be really interested to see um, how that shakes out once um, our safety professionals are talking to the engineers, because it does seem to me that there is enough room on, a, on that two lane design for everybody to get out of the way if there is an emergency vehicle on the bridge. So that's just something um, that I thought was important um, or that that jumped out at me. Yeah, because... Holly, uh, Holly, just just to yeah. uh, just to uh, step on that. Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, so it oh. seems to me we really have to get um, uh, Chief Janik and the, and the police officials involved in this. And if there's ample yeah. room to get uh, routine traffic out of the way to get an emergency vehicle through there, I think that's a solution we need to look seriously at. Mm -hmm. I agree. And that solution is, is engineered. So that, that's a strength right there. So um, we will, um, Janet will, uh, he does have this presentation and he will be looking at that. And that's going to be um, really important also um, you know, how we're tying into Douglas and we're running it by Brad at State Police. Um, so, and, and that's important. I've also talked to MDOT uh, briefly about AASHTO and, and they um, were, were glad that we were talking to our safety professionals and, and we're gonna continue that conversation, so. Um, but we do, you know, Cindy pointed out, we do have some engineering that's been done and it was good to see it. It was, it was very helpful. Um, does anybody so, else have anything you want to add? Yep, Brenda. I have a question. Um, so at what point, just so that I'm sure you've all been on groups where there's been duplication of efforts. So I don't want to waste anyone's time. 
at what point would we include the chief and then um, who would liaison with him basically? Would that be after further engineering or sooner? Well, I was hoping that he could be here today, but um, he was unable to be here. So um, I'm gonna, I'll invite him to our next meeting. And, okay. um, you know, if I've been, uh, been in discussion with him, um, and I know you have been in, you mm -hmm. talked to him on a, on a regular basis. So it's, I think it really depends on his schedule because he is right. so involved with the rollout of the COVID shots and COVID, obviously yeah. this cannot be a priority for him. So I'm just, yeah. I'm trying to, to, yeah. he's been very kind in, um, you know, sort of, uh, working with us and coming to the table, but I really want to be cognizant of, of his time. So, yeah. um, you know, we'll, I guess we'll sort of work that out as he, mm -hmm. um, is, is available, but I mean, um, it's, it is very important, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, um, we will definitely have his input, um, you know, as soon, as soon as he has the bandwidth, really. So, um, anybody else? Well, if, if I could make a couple of follow-up comments. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, if the three lane option is pursued, um, I should mention that the Douglas um, portion of the trail may have to be changed because it is 14 feet in width and that's how it lines up so well with Douglas. So if that ends up becoming 10 feet versus 14 feet, then the curb would be a, um, to the west a little bit of the existing curb south of Washington Street. So it's certainly Douglas needs to be involved in that decision. Now there might be other ways to address that in terms of striping, um, having it slide over once again we're not engineers <laughs> um, also when it comes to talking to the responders is there any feedback that you can provide us when it comes to the signals because in some cases traffic signals may, um, might be something that would make them feel more comfortable with um, how they could respond um, and how that might impact not only the bridge and clear the bridge but it also might help them navigate um, the two lane portion in Douglas if there's fewer cars going south on that portion of the road as well. So it would be helpful to have the, the at least the ability to talk to them about um, with or without um, the signals unless there's a strong sense that signals are not wanted. Uh, that's a great uh, comment about signals because um, I know that's something Ken and I have talked about and that's something that um, Chief and I talked about and I believe the data shows that uh, it's a right now that the that Allegan and help me out Ken is it Allegan and Blue Star that actually has um, a greater incident level yeah it would then, be uh, center street and douglas and Allegan. yeah yeah so so you know i do hear from a lot of people in the community that they would like to see lake street and blue star cleaned up or a light there so that is going to be i would say open to um uh the chief and the engineer to um uh, work out because that does need to be worked out and and that's going to be based on data, and that's going to be based on engineer engineering. So even if we don't um, put lane or put lights at Lake and Blue Star, I would imagine that we can just engineer that so that it's safer at, at the very least. But um, um, okay, thank you very much for that feedback. Oh, and I just wanted to make one more comment. So it sounds like what you're saying is the two lane design would actually fit better with what Douglas currently has. Is that correct? Well, yeah. So once again, that's coming from me and not an engineer. 
but the the two lane option um as we've discussed is 14 feet 14 feet in width in terms of the trail portion that mirrors what's in douglas south of washington street if it were reduced to 10 feet the curb would be a little bit further west if you're following me in other words four feet further in and so the it wouldn't line up quite as well with the existing curb in Douglas. However, as I said earlier, there may be a way that an engineer would design it in terms of striping or in some other way to address that possible concern. Uh, I'm sorry, did, was that clear? <laughs> if it's not clear. Uh, I think I, so. <laughs> okay, if it's not clear, Richard can probably go back to the Douglas portion of the um, option um, one and I could explain it more, more clearly or we can follow up with you later on. Yeah, let's just follow up later because I, I don't want to uh, keep folks too long. Um, is there, are there any other comments or questions or? Um, can you guys hear me or? Yes. Yes, is that Brett? Hi, this is, yeah, this is Lieutenant for the Sheriff's Office. Um, there's a couple, uh, this is a small considerations that I just wanted to bring up. Um, I know with like, uh, like, uh, you know, mercy vehicles, um, you know, obviously we're smaller, the police cars can probably make it around, you know, better than what the fire trucks and so forth can, um, just with, uh, you know, disabled vehicles and traffic stops, uh, you know, like where we have an arrest or something like that, that could, you know, uh, create a lot of congestion or an accident that we have to, you know, try to, you know, limit a lane or something like that. I just, you know, th those are just a little bit of areas of uh, concern with that. Um, the lights with the transmitters, I, I'm not sure how how that's going to work because um, there's just so many vehicles that come through their emergency vehicles. And I know with the county and the state police, um, you know, we could have multitude of, of vehicles assigned and stuff um you know probably with the fire department and the ambulance services you probably i know the ambulance service rotates out of hound sometimes if uh they have a lot of calls or fenville so there's probably not a lot of uh ambulances that you'd have to equ equip with some type of transmitter but uh you know for the emergency other smaller emergency vehicles if it was going to go that route it, uh, they have to be you know probably a, a quite a few um yeah, just a couple of little considerations there. Um, also, would the trail stop, you know, have the right of way and, and have any type of stop right there across Lake Street? Or is that, uh, or is there going to be like a stop sign there for, for the for the bikes for the, where the, uh, where they would cross Lake Street by Blue Star there? Well, um, thank you for your comments. Um, so, I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna have at Lake Street and Blue Star. That's what we're talking about. I mean, um, whether whether the data and the experts are really gonna, you know, um, if we're gonna end up putting a light there or just sort of re-engineer things. Um, but Lieutenant, can you go back to your first comment? What you said um, when you're pulling um, pulling cars over. There's an accident, and you need to clear uh, lanes or go around. Yeah, I mean, I could just see if there's not, uh, you know, like the like the bridges now, where there's several lanes uh, compared to you know the Douglas portion of laneage and stuff. If a car is disabled or breaks down there, or if we had a let's say a drunk driving arrest where we can't have the person get in the car and you know say hey pull over to the you know the the shell station. Um, you know, or, or have them uh, go up there, you know, that, that's those, those little, in, you know, things or an accident, um, you know, where it just, it's going to complete have congestion and so forth. So and just, just a couple of those considerations, you know, so. So, so having an open roadway might be easier in instances like that rather yeah. than curb. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for joining us today, Lieutenant. Not a problem, I'm glad to be here, so. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to uh, comment or has questions? Um, yeah, I do, this is uh, John Forzondek. You know, I, I ride the, uh, uh, the bike up Lake Street South to Blue Star 
And right now there is a narrow walk at across the street from Indian Summer. So I have to traverse from the street to a sidewalk. Will there be signage? Because for a biker, it's easy just to go straight up the road and then turn on the trail um, because, of the, because of the width of the sidewalk and sometimes there's people walking there and, and you have to slow down. So I see a lot of bikers, including myself, just take the road. Is there any consideration to cleaning that up or signage or, or how is that gonna work? I, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, I'm not too sure if I'm the best person to address that, but I might, I didn't understand what portion of the road um, you broke up during that section that you were trying to explain. Oh, so I'm going south on Lake Street uh -huh. and I'm turning right on the trail. Okay, Do you, so are you forcing, are you uh, forcing me to use that little strip of sidewalk or can I use the road? So the, are you saying you're on Lake Street to come to Blue Star Highway, you're turning right towards the bridge. Correct. If the trail um, if option one, or for that matter, um, option um, two is built, the existing sidewalk would be expanded from seven feet to 10 feet. And the users of the trail would be encouraged obviously to use um, that sidewalk and it should be able to handle it given the additional width. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. I think that was a member of the public. And I, I just want to remind uh, the public that we're going to have more comments at the end. Um, but thank you for answering that uh, question. And um, is there any anybody else on the committee or um, public safety that wants to comment at this time on the presentation? Okay, um, let's uh, move on. Uh, I'm wondering if we can, um, let's see. Next steps, um, engineering. Uh, I'm wondering, I know we talked to Karen about uh, at, uh, having the friends put some money in escrow with the city in order to cover engineering. And I, I believe that that's something that um, we would be able to do. Um, and I believe uh, the friends are close to uh, being able to um, uh, have a couple of firms that they want to look at for the overall trail design. Is that correct, gentlemen? Um, yeah, we're, Holly, we're, we are certainly aware of the different firms and, uh, and their interests, the, at least the firms in Southwest Michigan that have experience with trails. Um, but I would, I would just say this is a, you know, this is up to the committee. So it's, you know, don't be limited by us. If anybody on the committee has a suggestion uh, or would like to be involved in that process, by all means, we welcome them. Okay. Um, let's look at that uh, the next time we meet, which is a great segue. So um, I would propose that we meet uh, for a while um, every two weeks at this time. Would that be agreeable to the committee? Just so we yes. keep moving? Sure. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, as far as communications, the letter from the member of the public has been withdrawn. And uh, I'd like to uh, move to public comments at this time. Barry. Barry Johnson. Uh, thank you, Holly. Barry Johnson, uh, citizen of the city of Saugatuck. Um, been involved in these discussions for a number of years. And um, I think I got a pretty clear message from uh, Mr. Donovan that the Blue Star Trail is not interested in moving forward if the design doesn't meet ASHTO standards. <clears throat> My question is, is that uh, the 10 foot wide trail in the three lane design doesn't meet what I believe I heard was a 14 foot 
uh, AASHTO standard. And if you add the three feet uh, buffer and little foot lane there, that's 13. So we're still not there, but uh, can't the seven foot sidewalk uh, be part of the total measurement of the bike trail, which gives us a lot of uh, flexibility to get a 14 foot trail and then still add some feet to get those big old fire trucks uh, down a middle lane. I'm still an advocate of three lanes. And uh, so that could give you, uh, say if you did uh, seven foot in the road, seven foot on the sidewalk, there's your 14 feet. Uh, I had to keep your buffers there. That means you could uh, increase that uh, middle lane to as much as 13 feet. And of course, I love my Tootsie Roll because at 10 foot, this is all you get between you and a truck. So uh, now they may say, well, that's at two levels. Well, what's gonna cost to raise that seven feet to be even with the sidewalk? Uh, that would give you your 14 feet. Um, and again, the two lane means that the cars and trucks and RVs would have to pull into the bike path during the emergencies. That's one reason I'm not real in favor of a two lane. And I'd like to draw your attention and uh, Lieutenant Ensfield can uh, document this. I believe it was documented in July and I believe it was in 2019, but the years all run together right now uh, when the sheriff could not navigate the Douglas side due to no middle lane and there were pedestrians and cyclists in the bike lane. And we had a mission child at the Oval Beach and Lieutenant Ensfield couldn't get there during that emergency situation. So, uh, and I also was very interested in Lieutenant Ensfield's comments today about what if we've got uh, an accident on the bridge? Uh, what if we've got traffic stops on the bridge? Uh, I believe there's going to be uh, exits or entrance closures on 196, uh, which is going to tremendously increase the traffic on Blue Star during that construction. And the number of transmitters required uh, for a traffic light, a very expensive traffic light, uh, it was something that, that was new to me too. Uh, and it was good comment. Thank you, Holly. Okay, thank, thank you for your comments, Mary. Um, Anyone else from the public like to make a comment at this time? Hello. Hi there. Hi. Uh, Bob, I'd, I'd like to recognize you. Please make your comments. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bob Etter. Uh, I'm a resident of Saugatuck Township and an avid bike rider. Uh, I want to thank all the committee members for their service on this uh, important project. Uh, first of all, I'd like to state as, as a township resident, uh, I, I want to echo a comment that was made earlier. I believe there should be a traffic signal at Lake Street and Blue Star Highway, regardless of uh, whether and when a Blue Star Trail is built through. Uh, I've lived here for 12 years. It's, it's, the intersection needs a traffic signal. Uh, full disclosure, I am a member of the Friends of the Blue Star Trail. Um, and regarding the trail, my two cents. Uh, the past should inform us. The present should inform us. But we need a vision for the future. And I hope this committee and public safety officials are 100% committed to a fully connected Blue Star Trail in the not too distant future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else that would like to comment at this time? All right, I think we have come uh, to the end. Um, I will entertain a motion uh, to adjourn. Can I get a second? Did, did you wanna, um, did you wanna schedule now or do, should we just assume two weeks from today? At two o'clock? Okay. Can we do that? Okay, let's do that. Sorry, okay. I'm moving a little fast here. And sorry to sorry to interrupt your motion. Um, I just want to no, give a no. shout out shout out to Aaron because 
the materials are great to be presented. Yes, you had a little glitch, but I don't think you're in control of the internet in Sarata. Um, yes. But you've really, really done a great job. So I just want to express my appreciation. I know you're new. And so thank you. Sorry, Holly. No, Brenda, thank you. And as a matter of fact, does anyone else on the committee have any closing comments? I guess I should um, say that and make sure that we've got everybody covered. I mean, I'll just say, this is Kathy, I'll just say that I thought it was an excellent meeting, yes. especially the clarification. I've, you know, been aware of this for three or four years too, and I haven't had this much clarification in that whole time. And um, I, I like, I'm pleased to see that both options technically can work with some work and details to be figured out, but um, I'm just really pleased about that. It, it's good to connect us. I, t I tend to lean toward the two lane option only because of aesthetics. And um, I believe both can be safe, but I, I definitely would go either way because I want this done. Um, I believe the safety does come back to Chief Janik and all the other types of safety professionals, law, uh, law enforcement and so on to give us more information so we can make these reasonable decisions. Today, I couldn't possibly know which is safer, even though all that clarification happened. So that's that's my comment. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else on the committee wish to make a comment before we close out? All right, I think we're good. And yes, thank you, Erin. Thank you so much. That was above and beyond. Um, we'll plan on meeting in two weeks. Um, I will um, talk to Chief and uh, find out when he might be available and uh, maybe look into some AASHTO info um, and get back to everybody. But thank you. I think it was an excellent meeting. And um, I thank everybody for their time and their input. So, um, now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. This is Marcy. <laughs> All right. Second that this is Richard. All right. Um, do we need to do a roll call to leave Aaron or can yes, we just Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately on Zoom, everything is roll call. So Marcy? Yes. Richard Donovan. Yes. Trester? Yes. Osmond is gone. Jerry Donovan? Yes. Meridian? Yes. Adams? Yes. And Leo? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us while with our down internet. <laughs> you did a great Thanks, job. Holly.